1 Samuel chapter number 17, we have the, maybe the most famous story in the Bible. If you were to go door to door and start asking people, hey, tell me some stories that you know out of the Bible, they're probably going to mention you know, Noah's Ark, the story of Noah's flood. But there's a good chance that the majority may even come out with David and Goliath. David and Goliath is one of the most famous stories found in the entire Bible. But the most interesting part to me is the, the, the portion before they fight, when David and Goliath are conversing back and forth. And that's what we're going to read real quick. And I'm going to derive the title of my sermon from a particular statement here found in 1 Samuel chapter number 17. I want you to look with me at verse number 43. 1 Samuel chapter number 17, verse number 43, the Bible says this. And the Philistines said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the name of the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head up from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the I'll give the carcasses of the hosts of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Verse number 47. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. The title of the sermon this morning is The Battle of the Lord. The Battle of the Lord. Of the Lord. Now, Christianity, just Christianity as a whole, true biblical Christians are moving further and further away while being saved, while being a Christian, just Christianity in general is moving further and further away from true Christianity in many, in many ways. In practice, in preaching, in church services, in their daily lives, just over and over again, you can look at examples of churches, of saved individuals who are moving further and further away from biblical Christianity. And one of the major flaws, one of the core issues, is that Christianity is becoming watered down. Now what do we mean by watered down? We mean that it's becoming weaker. If you have something, a drink or something, that is, that is very potent, right? And you pour water into it, what happens? It's not as, what's potent mean? Strong. If something's impotent, it means it's not strong. So if something is a potent drink, it's a strong drink, if you put water into it, that's called diluting it, right? So what's happening or what's taking place is now that drink has become weaker. So we say that today Christianity has become watered down. What we're saying is that Christianity is becoming weaker and weaker as time goes on. When we right. look all throughout the Bible, what you see is from the beginning to the end, you see a battle taking place. The Bible is about a battle or a war going on between good and between evil. We'll go very, to the very beginning of the Bible. You know what you have? The first real story of the Bible, you have Adam and Eve being tempted by Satan. What do you have? You have right there a story of the battle of good and evil. That's what you have from the very beginning. You know what the next major story that takes place in the Bible is? Cain and Abel. You know what you have? A battle of good and evil. You have Cain, which is of that wicked one, of the seed of Satan, right? Like the Bible refers to him in 1 John. You have him coming and killing and slaying his brother Abel, who is said to be a righteous man. You have the battle of good and evil. You go all throughout the Bible. That is what the story of the Bible is about. Yes, it's about the gospel, of course. But all the individual stories, all throughout the Bible, what you have is a battle of good and evil. The Bible's message, of course, points to the gospel so that we can overcome evil in this world. But it's constantly a battle of good and evil. What we have here in 1 Samuel chapter number 17 is we have a battle going on of good and evil. The Goliath here, who is the champion known as, proclaimed as the champion of the Philistines, what is he doing? He's not just a random guy just fighting against the physical nation of Israel. No, he's going out and he's defying 
the name of the Lord, isn't it? You have an evil, wicked man, just like Cain. You have an evil man. You have the powers of evil there. You know what you have on the side of good? You have David coming and fighting for the side of good. What you see here is a battle going on of good and evil. You know how the Bible ends? You have the battle of, you have God pouring out his wrath, good, pouring out his wrath on evil, a battle going on while Satan is trying to overtake the earth. Then you have the Battle of Armageddon, known as in the Bible, the Battle of Armageddon. Then you have the Battle of Gog and Magog. You know what you have from beginning to end all throughout the Bible? A battle going on. Right. I thank God, you know, like the title of the sermon, that it's the battle of the Lord, that he owns the battle ultimately, and he's going to win the battle. But there's a battle going on nonetheless. And here's the thing. As a Christian, the moment that you got saved, the very moment that you called upon the name of the Lord and chose to trust Christ, you enlisted in that battle. Right. It's not a temporary enlistment. It's not just like a four-year enlistment. What's the, what's the average enlistments? What are they? Three, four years. Three, four years is what I thought. It was like two to four years is what I was going to guess. So four-year enlistment, you have a lifetime enlistment. Amen. And you don't have a choice in the matter. Now, you can, you can not engage in the battle, but that doesn't make you not involved on one side or the other. When you call upon the name of the Lord, you at that very moment became a child of God. You're put on the side of the battle and good, and you have no choice in the matter at that moment. Now, you don't, if you don't want to fight, that doesn't, like I said, remove you from the battle. It just makes you more vulnerable is what it does. Right. Now, all of these Christians that are living a watered-down Christianity, that want to pretend like there is no battle going on, that want to pretend like there is no fight or no war or anything of the sort, that doesn't exclude them from the battle. You know what it does? It just makes them more vulnerable. You know what it does? You know what it's going to do is it's going to cause them, you know, in some cases, yes, to physically die, but at least spiritually to have all sorts of issues in their life. To be defeated spiritually over and over and over again. To be destroyed spiritually by darkness, by the powers of evil, all these different types of things. So in the Old Testament, there was a physical battle going on, wasn't there? With the nation of Israel. Once the nation of Israel was founded, there was a physical there were physical fights that were going on, and that was the nation of the Lord, wasn't it? But here's the thing: the battle was still spiritual, even at that time. Even at that time, there still was a spiritual battle going on. There was a spiritual battle going on, and there was a physical battle going on. Well, the nation of Israel no longer exists today in the New Testament, the real nation of Israel, God's nation of Israel, that no longer exists today physically. It's a spiritual nation, isn't right. it? The battle didn't cease. The battle, when the, when the physical nation of Israel, the true nation that was founded by God, when it came to a halt, do you know what continued? The spiritual battle kept going on. There never was a time where there was a lapse where it stopped for a little while and then began again. No, it just continued. And it will continue all the way until the end of time. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. So, uh... The, one of the very, or actually the very first sermon that I preached here, you know, was about the subject of being valiant. Be ye valiant was the title of the sermon. And of course, I derived the title from the name of the church, Valiant. And the reason why I named the church Valiant Baptist Church is because it would always be a reminder to me of something uh, in, in Christianity that's very important, and that is to be brave. The reason is because we are always going to be in a battle. The Christian life is a battle. There's a war going on between good and evil. And we need to be just that valiant. We need to be brave. Valiant is a military term. When you look it up all throughout the Bible, it's always related to the armies. It's always related to military. We use it today in another form when people refer to a stolen valor. That's most commonly when you'll hear the word valiant used is in that way. It will refer to a stolen valor, valor. But here's the thing. The word valiant in the Bible, like I said, is always brought up. It's always talked about when someone is fighting. Well, yes, they needed to be valiant for a physical fight, but you also need to be valiant for the spiritual fight. There are many people that just duck out of the battle. There are many people that just want, don't want to face the fact that there's a battle going on. There are many people that don't want to engage in the battle. Even they'll acknowledge there's a battle, but they're too scared to get in the battle. The sermon this morning is, is going to be you know, the next reminder. I preached the first sermon at this church just telling everyone, talking about the word value. And in that sermon, I encourage you to engage in the battle. Well, this needs to be preached repeatedly. 
These types of things need to be reminders. I want to exhort you this morning. I want to remind you. I don't want you to forget that there is a battle going on. There is a real war between good and evil that is not going to cease just on your behalf. It is not going to cease just because you don't want to acknowledge it. There is a battle going on, and I want to exhort you to engage in the battle. The best thing that you can do is to fight. The worst thing that you can do is to step, try to step on the sidelines. Because there is no stepping off this battlefield. It doesn't work like that, my friend. You can try to get as close to the end as you can, but you know what you end up doing? Making yourself more, more vulnerable. You're over there all by yourself and not prepared. That's what you end up doing. The best thing that you can do is to just face the truth, not to try to you know, click your heels together and just get out of it, but to face the fact that there is a real battle. The Bible is truth. It teaches that there's a battle between good and evil. best thing that you can do is to prepare yourself for the battle. I want you to look here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, where the Bible talks about this spiritual war, this spiritual battle. Look at verse number 1. It says this, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, Wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Verse number three. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Saying our fight, uh, the fights that we engage in are not physical. We're not warring after the flesh, right? Verse number four, it says this. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So they're not physical. It's not a sword. It's not your fist. It's not, you know, a spear or anything of that sort. It's not carnal, it's spiritual. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What I like about that is a person that doesn't understand spiritual warfare, they are, especially a person that's not saved and not familiar with the Bible, they may say, you know, when you hear someone say, well, you know, our weapons aren't carnal, they're spiritual. They're probably like, yeah, you guys, you guys don't have carnal weapons, you got spiritual weapons. And try to mock it, but notice what it says after that. It says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Watch what it says. But mighty. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You know what it's saying? That the spiritual weapons are more mighty than a physical weapon. That's what it's saying. That to have a spiritual weapon, he says they're not carnal. He says, but they're spiritual. He says, mighty through God. But mighty, contrasting the two. Look at... Uh, Look at the uh, verse number 5 there. It says this. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Now, what do you think of immediately? Exalting itself against God. You think of Lucifer, don't you? think of Satan, don't you? Right? Well, we're going to compare this. I want you to keep that in your mind. We'll look at another passage here in a moment that, that's going to uh, shed more light on that. So it says... That exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Let's look more specifically at the spiritual weapons. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter number 6. which is a perfect parallel with this. We actually get a list of spiritual weapons. Spiritual weapons. Now just like in... A physical army or a physical military that fights, obviously, a physical battle, they have to be familiar with their weapons. The last thing you want to do is to go out into a battlefield and not know how your weapon functions, whatever you may have. I mean, that, that would be the worst situation. You might, not, you, you might as well not even have a weapon in the first place if you're not able to operate. It's, it's not going to help you at all. So you know what? The weapons that God provides for you spiritually, you better be familiar with those weapons. Because like I said, the introduction of the sermon is important to keep in your mind all throughout until the end of the sermon. Here's the thing. The battle continues. Just because you don't know how to operate your weapon, somebody's not going to take it easy on you. If you're, you know, if you're over fighting, if there's some sort of, you know, obviously it's not a real fight, but in Iraq or something like that going on, if... If a battle is, is, is taking place and there are opposing sides that are fighting one another, is someone going to, on the, on the opposite side, if your gun jams, let's say, or you don't know how to use your gun, are they going to give you a second, hey, go ahead and fix that? No. Go, you know, go back there, you know, think you got it, you know, I realize it's jamming, I realize 
You know, you may not be familiar with that particular type of assault rifle, whatever it may be. Just go, you go fix that and then come back and then we'll, it'll make, let's make it fair. It doesn't work like that. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Here's the thing. Satan would prefer you not to know how to use your weapon. Right. The devil would prefer for you not to know your Bible. The devil would prefer for you not to be spiritually strong. You know, I played basketball my whole life. My whole life was consumed with basketball, basically, while I was growing up. And I would have loved to get on the court and play against a team that just wasn't familiar with basketball. Now, I wouldn't take it easy on someone. My coach might pull out the starters, and I might be sitting on the bench the rest of the game. But we would play a team, for whatever reason, they were on our roster every single year. Covington Latin. That's the name of the school. Now, you can probably theorize what type of kids these were. You know, most of them were like 13, and they're a senior in high school. And they have, you know, they're, they're already into like three years in college, literally. So, I mean, our school is like, you know, we were like 21 and 7 or something like that. We're a good basketball team. We are just blowing these, this team out of the water. You know, every time we played it, we just blew this team out of what? Do you think that we're like, oh, you know, we realize you guys haven't played basketball very much. We'll just let you have that free shot. Not a chance. Yeah. You know, this, there's, a, there's a battle, if you will, going on on the court, right? And we're going to win the We're going to win the game. <clears throat> Any type of, you know, uh, uh, competition, right? Any type of battle. Any type of, you know, uh, where there's, where there's two, two opposing sides engaging, there's a goal to win, right. isn't there? Amen. There's a goal to win, and here's the thing. Satan understands that. The devil understands that, and he wants to win, and he's not going to take it easy on you. He would prefer for you not to know your weapon. He would prefer for you not to be prepared to go into battle. Now, right here in Ephesians chapter number 6 is very important because it actually gives you your spiritual weapons. These are weapons that you need to be familiar with. To go forth into battle and to be successful. Look at verse number 10. It says this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Notice that. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we don't fight a physical fight, right? We don't wrestle uh, against flesh and blood. But then it says this, but against principalities. That's another word for like power. Something that's principal is at the top. Like a principal of the school is saying that he's the top leader. So top leaders is what it's saying. Elite leaders, principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. There were rulers of the time, of the darkness, of the world when Paul was living, wasn't there? They didn't go anywhere. Those guys may have died, but that, that torch was handed down the line. There are spiritual leaders on the side of darkness today that, have, that are in a, a, a position of authority. Look at verse number 13. It says this, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Now, Verse number 13, what does it begin with? The word what? Wherefore. Do you know what that means? Because of that. Because what? Because there are what? There is evil, basically. Because there is evil, you need to take the whole armor of God. What does that mean? That means if you don't take the whole armor of God, you're going to be destroyed. You're going to lose the battle. You're going to, in a sense... In this sense, it looks, we're just comparing this, of course, to the analogy of fighting in the battle. What is it saying? It's saying that you will die. That's what it's saying. Right? If it was an analogy of a battle going on, saying that you will lose the battle if you don't take this. So wherefore, take unto you the whole armor, not some of it, the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. So we see, first off, truth. Truth is important. You know, the truth obviously is what? The Word of God, isn't right. it? Right? Most of these things are going to point back to the Word of God that we read. It says the breastplate of righteousness. It's important to be living a righteous life, isn't it? To know what is right and what is wrong. Where does it derive from? The Word of God. We need to be living as, as much as we can a righteous life daily. 
Look at uh, verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This may not be pointed out very often, but I want you to notice that a part of your armor is going soul winning. That's what this means. Amen. With the preparation of the gospel of peace. What does that mean? That you are prepared to preach the gospel. It says that your feet are shod. Shod means to have something on, right? It's just another way of saying uh, clothed or covered, but it's a specific reference to shoes, if you will. That's where our word shoe came from, shod. That's where the, our modern day word came from. It's talking about something being on your feet. But this is a part of, the, your, this is a part of your weapons. You ever notice that before? This, uh, this goes in the category of the weapons when he's talking about being prepared against spiritual wickedness is being prepared to preach the gospel. You know what that means? If you're not preaching the gospel, if you are not going out and preaching the gospel, and especially being prepared to preach the gospel, having that in your heart, having the heart of preparation of preaching the gospel to others, you're vulnerable in the battle. You're vulnerable uh, you know, to the attacks of evil. Look at verse number 16. Above all, so what does that mean? This is the most important thing. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. We see the importance of faith. When you read Hebrews chapter number 11, Hebrews chapter number 11 is not the faith of a person being saved. You know, uh, it's not the faith of a person of when they're saved. It's their faith throughout their life. How all the great things that people were able to do, all the great feats. And you know what's at the end of Hebrews 11? It's talking about battles a lot. It's talking about a lot of physical fights, isn't it? You know what was important for them? You know what they needed? You know what got them through those fights? Do you know why David was able to defeat Goliath? Do you know why he went forth in the first place? Did he sound like he was questioning whether or not he was going to win that fight? That's my favorite thing is the confidence that David had. But it wasn't his own confidence in, his, in himself. It was the confidence that he had in the Lord. Man. He's like, I'm surely going to take your head from you, buddy. He's standing before some guy that's like nine feet tall. Think about that. And, and he's a, you know, they say he's a child, he's a youth. He's probably 17, 18 years old. And he's standing before a man that's 40 years old or so that's been fighting his entire life. While David has never been in, in a physical fight as far as in an army, ever. And he stands before Goliath. And he just tells him, like, there's no question about this. When the, here in just a moment, when this fight's over, I'm going to have your head. And he's not fearful at all. Why? Because of the great faith that he had. That was the reason why David won that battle. Amen. was because of the great faith that he had. That was the reason why David went forth to fight in the first place when he went to Saul. He told Saul, he knew, even when he spoke to Saul, he was just as confident. Why? It's his faith. It's his great faith. All the people that have done great things all throughout the Bible. All throughout the Old Testament, all the people that are counted great in the Bible, do you know what their greatest attribute is? Their faith. Always. Amen. People Amen. always put the emphasis on the faith at the moment of salvation, which is great. Yes, you're saved. And I understand emphasizing salvation. It's obviously the most important thing. But you're already saved. You yourself are already saved. What are you going to do now with your life? Just talk about your salvation every day, all day? Just how great it was? No, you need to grow. You need to move on. You need to grow and move on to the strong meat. Right. And not say a babe in Christ and just fixating on your salvation always. Yeah, praise God for it. Thank God for it. But there's other things to, the lot, to life and other things to Christianity other than just being saved. There's a lot more. Now, if that doesn't sound right to you, then there's something wrong with your understanding about the Bible. There's something wrong with your understanding about Christianity. It, you know, Christianity is not just about being saved. That's the easy part. That's the simple part. You know what's going on now? There's a battle. Right. And now you need faith still. You need faith to win and to engage in the battle. Look at what it says in verse number 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Look at verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Notice that's a part of your spiritual preparation is prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Even praying for other people. I don't know if you noticed that before too. This is a part of We're still on the same subject right now. We're talking about praying. That's a part of your spiritual preparation for this battle is praying for yourself and supplications that you need, but praying for other people as well. Being prepared for this battle. Also, right now, these are things that are meant to protect you, if you've noticed that. 
when we're speaking about this, these are weapons and things, but these are meant, these are things that are specifically talked about in order to be used to defend yourself against evil. And one of the things that's mentioned is the sword of the spirit. Now, a sword can be used as an offensive weapon or a defensive weapon, can't it? That's another thing to keep in mind. I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. We'll see Paul talking about the Christian life is being a battle or fighting. I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. I'll read you just while we're here. 2 Timothy chapter, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter number 4 is what I want you to turn. I'm going to read you from 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Here's verse number 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Then he says this. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth. Notice that. No man that warreth. It's a war. It's a battle. Entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. He said, thou therefore endure hardness. The Christian life is not just easy. The Christian not life is not just, you know, flowers and rainbows and unicorns. and That's not the Christian life. Right. If you, here's the thing, if, if that's how your Christian life is, then there's a problem with your Christian life. Right. If, if you don't have troubles, if you don't have trials, if you don't have problems, then there's an issue with the way that you're living as a Christian. There's a major problem. Yes, there's the blessings of the Lord, but there's problems too. And that comes with living the Christian life. That comes with engaging in the battle of good and evil. You know, a lot of these, a lot of these new evangelical churches, a lot of these, you know, really soft, weak churches, if they're not ever getting in battles, if they're never getting in battles with the world, if they're never getting in battles with the powers of wickedness and the devil and Satan and, and just and just any sort of fight ever, there's an issue. If a pastor pastors a church for 40, 50 years and you can never think of a spiritual fight that he's been in, there's a problem. There's a major, major problem. The world looks at it the opposite way, don't they? They're like, if they're, you know, they're they're just a, such a contentious church or such contention people. Yeah, there's a fight going on. Right. There's yeah. a fight going on between good and evil. That's right. Look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Look at verse number 5 first. It says this, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Does it sound like everything was just easy peasy for Timothy? No. Endure afflictions. Like he said before, endure hardness. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departure is at hand. Watch verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Notice what he said there in the very beginning. He said, I have fought a good fight. You know when Paul looked back, what he's doing right now is he's summarizing his life. You know when he looks back at his life, you know what he considers the things that he's been, he's been doing in his life? Fighting. He said, I have fought a good fight. He considers it a fight. When you look at Paul's life, you know what's going on? It's a lot of hardness that he endures. It's a lot of afflictions that he endured. That's the Christian life. That's the, that is what is going to happen. You know, to everyone that lives godly, the Bible says, they'll suffer persecution. Everyone. So if you're not suffering for persecution, you're not living godly. That's according to the Bible. That's not just, you know, my opinion. That's what the Bible teaches. There's a fight that, that, that every Christian is enlisted in, a war that every Christian is enlisted in. If the battle is of the Lord, thank God. But you need to engage in the battle. Paul engaged in the battle. And let me say this. There's a personal fight, number one. That's the first thing that I want to talk about. There's a, there's a, a, a personal decision that you have to make in order to step into this fight. And there's a personal fight. That's why he says, I. He says there in verse number seven. I have fought a good fight. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter number four. Matthew chapter number four. What are the things that you can do to prepare yourself personally for this battle? Well, you can read your Bible. You go back to Ephesians chapter number 6. We see the Bible referenced in many different ways. You can read your Bible to prepare for this fight, to prepare for this battle. What else can you do? You can memorize Scripture. You can memorize the Bible. 
What else? There are many things. You can pray. You can live a righteous life and be prepared. There are probably examples, maybe, if you've been in the Christian life, where you can look and you can see people that you consider elderly, that you consider to be Christians, that you consider to be a great Christian, maybe, that went to church, that you know, uh, maybe had been a dedicated Christian for many, many years, as far as attending church, and they had a routine of things like this. But there was a time in which they maybe fell away from the faith. Now, of course, I'm not saying rejecting Christ and things like that. But they fell away from the faith as far as coming to church. Maybe they committed some sort of grievous sin. That tells me that they were prepared when that temptation came. When evil came, and evil came to strike, there was a time in which evil approached this person, wasn't there? Where there was a temptation that was brought from evil in the battle of good and evil. It was brought to this person. You know what happened? They failed. They failed. They, you know why? Because they weren't prepared for the battle when the battle came. Look at Matthew chapter 4. We see an example of Jesus here being approached with evil, being approached with Satan, or by Satan. It says in Matthew 4, 1, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward in hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, earlier I talked about how Satan doesn't care whether you're prepared or whether you're ready. Satan would prefer to you, prefer for you not to be prepared, would prefer for you not to be ready. He would prefer for you to be as vulnerable or as weak as possible. And when did Satan approach Jesus here? When he was hungered, when he was in a weaker state, wasn't he? That's when Satan decided to come says he afterward in hunger. And then it says, and when the tempter came, what does he do? He tries to tempt him with his weakness, doesn't he? Wherein he thinks that he will fall. That's the, that's the attitude of Satan. And we see actually Satan coming here more in a bodily sense, right? Actually in a spatial sense coming to him where I assume that Jesus is able to see him and they're communicating in some way different than which you will be tempted in that area. But my point is actually this. You're tempted in the same way that he's tempted in the sense that the, the temptation is brought to you. He may not be you know, face to face with you. It may not be something spatially where you can see him spiritually, right? Or see him in a, some sort of bodily form. But he will come to you and he will try to tempt you with things the same way in which he came to Jesus here. And it says this, verse number four. But he answered and said... It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So we can see what does is, what is Jesus utilize immediately? The sword of the Spirit, doesn't he? He brings out the sword of the Spirit. Was he ready for the battle? He was in this sense, was he? Right here in this circumstance, he was. Of course, he always was. But here we have a perfect example of when he was prepared. When he was prepared and ready for the battle. And what did he do? He went immediately to the word of God. Look at verse number 5. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stones. Remember what we spoke about and uh, we looked at in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. It talked about all the high things that exalted itself against God, right? Who did that? Lucifer. And this is what? Who we're battling with. Who do you have Jesus battling with here? Lucifer, Satan. Who is who? He exalts himself against. See the, the comparison? Who is it speaking about in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10? It's of course talking about spiritual wickedness in high places, which is ultimately Satan. Look at verse number uh, 7. Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt, tempt the, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Verse 8. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, all these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only. Shout out, sir. Every single time, what does Jesus go to immediately? The 
Word of God. Amen. Do you know what that tells me? If you don't know the Word of God, when the tempter, not if, or not, you know, that's, that, you see, it's not if the tempter comes to you. It's when the tempter comes to you, I can guarantee that you'll fail. I can guarantee that you'll fall if you don't know the Word of God. I look at the, the, the only perfect example that we really have in the Bible when Satan comes to someone to tempt them. And every time, what is the defense and the offense? What is it? The Word of God. Well, let's look at an example where someone fails. And this is a perfect parallel because... The counterpart of Jesus, the negative, uh, according to Romans 5, of the, of the anti-type is Adam, isn't it? Same way in which Adam condemned all men, Jesus saved all men, Romans 5 explains. Well, Jesus is successful here when the tempter comes, right? Well, what happens when the tempter comes to Adam? What happens? He fails, doesn't he? Did, did Adam have what he needed? He, well, he did, but he didn't utilize it. What did he need? The word of God. What did God say? Don't eat of that tree. What did Satan come and do? Of course, to Eve first, but Adam's the one that takes responsibility. He comes and what? Satan comes and tells him, hey, that's not true. Hey, that's what, what, you know, what he said in a roundabout way is not true. What he, had, he had you know, the word of God at his exposure, but evidently he didn't know it well enough. He didn't have faith in it enough. He didn't use it. Now, you may have a Bible, but if you're not familiar with the Bible, the tempter will come to you at some time. You can look at examples, and I don't need to name names repeatedly, but look at examples of Christians that failed. Failed in their Christian life majorly. Destroyed their families and did all these things. Are there Bibles that could, Bible verses that could have helped them and stopped them from doing that? You know what that tells me? They weren't prepared with the Word of God. That's what that tells me. If they knew those verses better, if they were ready when the tempter came, there was a time when the tempter actually came to those people, wasn't there? There was a time when the tempter came to them and presented this idea to them of, hey, why don't you do this? Doesn't this sound like a good idea? You remember we used to do this? Why don't we do it one more time? And there were Bible verses that said, don't do that. This is what will happen. And what happened? Exactly. What did God say? Don't do that or you'll die. What did Satan say? You're not going to die. It's not that big of a deal. You take heed to the warnings of the Bible. There's a real battle going on. And it, everybody thinks that it's just fun and games. Watered down Christianity. All these people that aren't engaging in the battle. But you can look at examples of people personally who have ruined their lives, who have ruined their families, who have ruined churches because of losing in the battle personally. Because of losing and not being prepared personally with the Word of God. That is the most important thing that you have. That's where your faith comes from. Yes, faith is mentioned in Ephesians 6, but what is your faith in? The Word of God. Yeah. Basically, everything points back to the Word of God. Yeah, you, prayers mentioned. How do you know how to pray? The Word of God. This is the most important thing that you have. So if you're not reading your Bible, that's a major problem in Christianity. Right. Major problem with your Christianity if you're not reading the Bible. You will fail in your Christian life. I, no buts and if you will fail in your Christian life if you don't know your Bible. Period. You will. Jesus, in this case, of course, if he... And it's, and it's, of course, hypothetical and would never, ever happen, not possible. But if he wasn't prepared or if someone's not prepared in a situation, what other examples? Let's use that. Other examples where people are able to overcome in the Bible Satan, who are able to overcome the temptation of evil, if they weren't prepared with the word of God, they would have failed. What was David's faith in? It was in God, but... It was in the Word of God, wasn't it? All the promises, all the things that he knew. When you see David writing, you know the proof of that? Go read the Psalms. What does David always emphasize? The Word of God. Always. You know where his faith was coming from? The Word of God. You know what the most important thing is to know your Bible for the battle of good and evil. That is it. That is what everything, that's the core of all of your Christianity when it comes to this, to this topic. <clears throat> I want you to turn to Jeremiah chapter number 51, verse number 30. 
Jeremiah chapter. Actually, we'll go there in a moment. I want you to go to Joshua chapter number 24. So first we have the personal fight. Paul says, I, right? I have fought a good fight. The personal battle that goes on. But there's also a battle going on for your family. And yes, the man is the head of the household, and he needs to step up. But there's also, of course, the responsibility of the women also, the mothers. Go to Joshua chapter 24, and we can see the example of the man taking the lead in the home. Joshua chapter number 24. Joshua chapter number 24. And this is the attitude that all men should have. Joshua chapter number 24, verse number 14, says this. Now, therefore, Joshua speaking unto and exhorting the children of Israel. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. And serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. Then he says this, But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. First we saw the personal battle spoken of, right? With Paul, where he says, I have fought a good fight. But you know what? There's more than that. There's families here, of course. And there's a, a battle going on for specifically the family. There's a, there's a battle of good and evil today over the families. And right here, what we see is a man standing up and making the decision for his whole household. He doesn't question them. He doesn't ask them first. He says, hey, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's what the men need to do. They need to make the decision that for their household, we are going to serve the Lord. Now, just a moment ago, I spoke about the most important thing for the Christian. And what was it? The Bible. Knowing the Bible. So you know what men need to be doing? Making sure that their wives, making sure that their children who are at the age of reading are reading their Bible and know their Bible. If your child doesn't know the Bible, it's your fault. As, as a father, it is your fault if your child doesn't know the Bible. Furthermore, if your wife doesn't know the Bible, it's your fault. You know what Joshua said? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He didn't go and ask his wife, hey, honey, do you want to serve the Lord? He said, my old family, we're going to serve the Lord. I'm telling you, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. The husband there made the decision and said, we are going to serve the Lord. You know Amen. what you need to do? Take the example of Joshua, of a strong leader who stands up as a man and said, my wife is going to serve the Lord and all of my children are going to serve the Lord. Amen. I'm, I'm telling you what you're going to do and you are going to serve God. That's what you're going to do. But you know, you also do need to set a good example. Of course, you know, no one wants to follow a hypocrite. Not that that doesn't make it okay. The wife should still follow, you know, should still do what the husband says, especially if it's in accordance with the Bible. Yeah, of course, when it's in accordance with the Bible. But here's the thing. Even if your husband's a hypocrite and he's not doing these things, he's not reading his Bible, that doesn't give you, you know, this opt-out option. You still need to read the Bible. You're still held personally responsible as well for not reading your own Bible. But men need to stand up and they need to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There is a battle going on. There is a battle going on between good and evil. And there are people out there that want to destroy your family. There are people out there who they, they desire carnage, especially in homes and in families. There are divorce lawyers out there who would love, think about this, who would love for you to call tomorrow and get, to, get, to get your business. I, that's not a question. They make their money and their profit off of this. They would love for you to call tomorrow and say, hey, I, I'm inquiring for your services. You think he would be sad? He would be happy. That's just one petty example. There are people out there who institute things, who have systems designed to attack families. One of the major ones is, of course, the, you know, the LGBT movement. They hate normal families. They, they, there's no question about this. They hate normal people. They hate normal families. That's just a fact. You have this thing just, uh, just yesterday, or two days ago or something, that I saw the Moo Moo thing. I mean, how wicked can you possibly be? Yeah. Like, it's almost, it feels like this can't be real. 
You know why? Because you're not evil like that. But there are real people out there. There are real people out there. It's just a disgusting thought just to think of one of your small children watching something like that. Just think of just one of your small, younger children, like my son Elijah, looking and watching. And this wicked, wicked person that made that video trying to get a message like that to my son. Imagine someone trying to do that to you. Now, here's the thing. Whether you want to step on the sidelines, whether you want to not be involved in the battle or not, means nothing because there are people out there doing things like that who are trying to attack and hurt your children either way. Right. So whether or not all these watered-down Christians, whether or not non denom around the corner wants to acknowledge a battle going on, they want to get your children, my friend. They want to hurt your family, my friend. They want to go after you, your husband, you, your wife, you, your children. They want to destroy your family. They want to destroy your children. That's right. They want to hurt your kids. Like I mentioned just a few weeks ago in the Genesis 19 sermon, all of these bunch of queers and faggots would love to have your children butt naked walking in some pride parade. They would love that. They're actively recruiting children. Where do you think all these stinking transvestite freaks love to go? I see them on stinking the news constantly where? Reading school books to little tiny children. Why is that? Why? Because they want to try to get into their minds early on when they're vulnerable. What, is, what did I say earlier? They don't care whether you're active in the fight. They would rather you to be weaker. That when did Satan go to Jesus? The moment when he'd be the most vulnerable. Why are they going after children? Because they're weak, they're vulnerable, they don't know. They think if I can get to them early on, you think that that's not strategic, then you're an idiot. If you think that that's, why are they not trying to go and, why are they actively focusing their attention to grown adults? Because they want to target the weak, that's right. just like Satan did in, in Matthew 4. Jesus' flesh was weak, and he said, I'm going to go after him now. He didn't go to him before. He didn't go to him after. He went to him right when he was weak. You know when they want to attack your children when they're weak? Do you know what you need to be doing then? Not acting like there's not a battle. Not trying to step out of the battlefield. Not trying to move to the sidelines. The best thing that you can do is say, Hey, son, take your sword. Hey, daughter, take your sword. Hey, wife, get your sword and get up early and read your Bible. Amen. They need to be prepared. Maybe if your children were aware of the evil in this world, maybe if your children were aware that there really are wicked people, if they read about Satan, a real person who loves to destroy, who loves to hurt, and that this is reality, then they would be prepared for things like that if they came across a video, God forbid, like that. They would know, this is evil. This is wicked. This is, this is Satan right here. This is the devil. And, he, and, and here's the thing. He's real. There are really, there, in reality, there are wicked, evil people out there. Now, whether you want to face that or not, and people just love to live in a fairy tale land. They just love to just pretend. People do this in all areas of life, but they just want to ignore the truth when it's uncomfortable. That's the worst thing you can do. That's the worst thing you can do in all situations. In all situations. Just ignore that there's a hell. I just don't like to think about it. How many times have you heard people say that? Does that avoid the fact that hell's real? Even, even if... We speak of this objectively. I say it to atheists all the time. Sometimes they'll say, well, I just don't like the idea of hell. I say, okay, objectively, just for a moment. If you don't like the idea of hell that I am right and it is real, does that cause it to not exist? It's stupid. So if the Bible's true, which it is, there's a battle between good and evil going on. So we would expect to see things like that. There are people that want to hurt you. There are people that want to hurt your family. There are people that, would, that want to hurt your wife. There are, there are women that would love to cause your husband to commit adultery. There are men that would love to cause your wife to commit adultery. There are you know, people out there that seek after things like this, that look for opportunities to do wickedness and to hurt other people and to hurt family. The Bible talks about the adulterous woman and how she enjoys hurting and destroying families. There are people like this out in the world. You know what you do? You don't just ignore it. You don't just hope. I just hope that it never happens. What you do is you get you become prepared. That's what you do. You prepare yourself. And you know what you need to be telling? You know what you need to be doing for your family? You need to be making sure that your wife is 
husbands, you need to be making sure that your wife is familiar with her sword. You need to be making sure that your son is familiar with his sword. You need to be making sure that your daughter is familiar with her sword, right. with her Bible. You need to make sure that these people are ready. Because this, this war is going on whether you like it or not. This is a battle that's going on that is being fought and has been fought for, for a very long time. And it's, never, it's not going to end until the end of time. I want you to go now to Jeremiah chapter number 51, verse number 30. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse number 30. Wait for me just a moment. I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians where Paul, again, speaks about battling and fighting. People just want to ignore the idea that there's a fight going on. Even though the Bible talks about fighting, about there being a spiritual war, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32, Paul says this, If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it me? If the dead rise not... Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Notice he said, if after the manner of men I fought with beasts at Ephesus. So what is he doing? He's fighting, isn't he? He says beasts at Ephesus. You know, we need to be battling. We need to be fighting in our Christian life. We need to, just, you know, Paul said, follow me even as I follow Christ. Right. You need to be following his example of fighting. You need to be following Joshua's example of leading your family spiritually. If you're, Who are you fighting? If you're not fighting, you know... The LGBT movement, if you're not fighting, if you want, you know, just to say that, you know, we shouldn't fight them, we should just love them. If you, you know, if you say we shouldn't fight all these false religions, we should just love them. Who in the world is your enemy? Who are you fighting then? Who is Paul fighting? Who is the Bible talking about that you're battling or fighting? There's a fight going on. There's a battle going on. You don't need to ignore it. You need to engage in the battle. You need to fight in the battle. So that's the first thing was that I wanted to focus on was, was preparation. I wanted to focus on the, the importance of preparation. And I talk about how there's a personal battle. There's also a fight or a battle for your family. There's also a fight or battle amongst churches, aren't there? And sometimes, and I want to talk about this for a moment, sometimes there can be you know, uh, people that are saved that are fighting against one another. Right now, now this is... And we're going to kind of step outside of the realm of what we were talking about a moment ago, about good and evil. Those that are saved are automatically on the side of good by imputation. They are, they're imputed righteousness. They're fighting on the Lord's side, and they are good because of His righteousness. It's not, oh, I live a good life. Of course, we know salvation is not based upon how good we are. But it's the side of good because we're on the Lord's side, right? <clears throat> but, and because of that, because it's imputed righteousness... That's why the Bible will talk about, hey, walk as children of light. What is that implying? That, 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 that question would be, you know, uh, irrelevant if it was not possible for you to walk as a child of darkness. Do you understand that? So you know what a person could do is they could fight on behalf of evil, couldn't they? They could do something evil, can't they? I mean, a perfect example of this, we're talking about spiritual fights. I'm not talking about a personal battle. I'm talking about a spiritual fight which would be between good and evil. It has to do with good and evil. The Word of God, of course, right? There can be a Christian that is fighting on the side of evil, and what would they be doing? Let's say preaching heresy. Let's say that they're preaching something that's, or doing something that someone is doing on the other side. You know what the best thing you can do for your neighbor in, in the, the case of him sinning? Talks about to love your neighbor is actually, thou shalt not hate thy neighbor in thine heart, thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor. Mm -hmm. You know what's good for your neighbor if he starts walking in darkness, if he starts, you know, fighting on, the, on behalf of evil? You know what's good for him? To rebuke him. Right. You know, and this again, watered down Christianity is right out the window again. This is not down their aisle. This is not things they feel comfortable with. Right? But this is Bible. The best thing you can do for someone that's wrong in any case is to rebuke them. That's why the Bible, of course, the Bible is always right. So the Bible says, spiritually, if someone's wrong, if someone's sinning, if someone is preaching heresy, you know what you need to do? You need to rebuke that person. Man. You need to correct that person. So sometimes there will be what's called friendly fire, won't they? Mm -hmm. Now, friendly fire is just people that are on the same side. That a lot of times it's, it's accidental when people are referring to it. But sometimes people on the same side can get into a fight, can't they? This happens all the time. If you haven't been a Baptist very long, then you may not be aware of this. But churches splitting that are of the Baptist stripe, especially fundamental Baptists, happens a lot. Churches getting in fights happens a lot. And that's because 
you know, independent fundamental Baptists are very zealous. They really believe what they believe. And a lot of times it's over petty things. A lot of times, you know, they're going too far about something stupid. Like, you know, you don't like the piano there, they think it should go over here. I tell you, just get out of here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Whether or not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether or not, you know, Adam and Eve, or Adam and, uh, or you wouldn't have to say Eve, but Adam had a belly button, right? People will argue over foolishness. Now, if you're, you think I'm getting, but churches split over, like, situ situating the piano and things like that. Really. I've heard of the most ridiculous things. You know, but sometimes, there are times, there are times when a church splits because maybe the pastor starts preaching something that's heretical. Maybe, you know, something goes on where somebody is preaching something heretical. Maybe not only just church splits, maybe there are fel there's fellowship between two people because one person gets into heresy. And maybe the, the person that's right goes to correct them, and the other guy just kind of stiffens his neck and hardens his heart. The Bible talks about, once again, that Christians, one of the works of the flesh is heresy. So a Christian can get into heresy. A Christian can preach something that is heretical. Now, a lot of times this can discourage people. A lot of times when someone that's on the side of good turns against you or someone that's on the same side as you can try to fight against you or hurt you or do something against you, it can be discouraging, and I understand that to a degree. It can discourage you. But let me just say this. Like I said... You know, it's a battle. I want you to think about it. It's a real battle. It's bloody, isn't it? It's bloody. I'm sure if you were able to get a, to get a, uh, what do they call those things? The cameras? Well, you know, that you can record with a GoPro or something and put it on the head of a soldier that's going forth into battle. It's gruesome. It's nasty. It's bloody. It's not something that's pleasant. Fighting is not, a fight is not, you know, something that people just love, right? But here's the thing. That doesn't give you a reason to just step on the sidelines either. There is no reason ever to quit fighting. Amen. And even if, even if there is someone that you love, there is someone that's, that, that you, know, you care about, there's someone that is a fellow brother, and even if they go so far as to say that you're not saved, even if they go so far, even, either situation, the point is this, any type of situation, there's never a time to stop fighting. Amen. Amen. You, the point, one thing to keep in mind, though, a principle to guide you while you're doing that, a reference point, is you better make sure that you are on the side of good, though. You better make sure that you're not walking in darkness, that you're not preaching heresy. You need to make sure that you're on the side of good still. But the Bible talks about those. Go to Jeremiah. You're probably there already. Jeremiah chapter number 51. This is a good verse here. I love this verse. Somebody, I've read over it and it never really stuck out to me. But the Bible talks about people that, that decide, hey, I just don't want to fight anymore right here. In Jeremiah chapter number 51, verse number 30, and it's the mighty men. It makes me think of valiant Baptists. You know what the mighty men are also called? Valiant. The mighty men of David I'm referring to. They're called valiant men repeatedly. That's where it's used the most, like 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings. First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, you see valiant being used because the military is discussed a lot. Battles, wars are being talked about a lot. So it makes me think of Valiant Baptist Church. It talks about the mighty men. And it's an encouragement to stay valiant. It's an encouragement to stay mighty. It's an encouragement to stay in the fight. What's the name of our church? We're almost on a year now, right? Coming up on a year. It's Valiant Baptist Church. And the name of the church is meant to be a reminder, isn't it? And the first thing you think of when you think of valiant, you look it up in the Bible, what do you see? It's battling, fighting, warring. You know what we need to continue to do? Be valiant. Amen. We need to continue to be mighty. Amen. We need to keep fighting the fight. You need to not let something discourage you and step off, the, or try to step off the battlefield, right. to try to get out of the way of the fight. You know what you need to do? You need to keep fighting. Amen. And sometimes the fight is engaging with other brethren and having to straighten out maybe a, a, a brother in Christ. Right. Look at Jeremiah chapter number 51. Look at verse number 30. We'll just read this isolated verse. It says this. The mighty men of Babylon have forborne. That means they've, they've stopped, right? Have forborne to fight. They have remained in their holes. What does that mean? 
They're trying to hide in their caves or in their forts, right? They have remained in their holds. Their might have failed. They became as women. They have burned her dwelling places. Her bars are broken. Look at verse 31 to 32 here. It says, One post shall run to meet another, and one messenger to meet another, to show the king of Babylon that his city is taken at one end. Because they're beginning to what? They're beginning to lose here. Then in verse 32, and the passages are stopped, and the reeds, they have burned with fire, and the men of war, look at this, are affrighted. What is it saying? They're afraid. You know what the opposite of being afraid is? Being valiant. That's right. Not being afraid. Amen. Even if it seems like you start to lose, is that a reason to give up? The worst thing you can do is go into your hole. Right. That's the worst thing you can do is try to get out of the fight. If you become discouraged, that's not a reason to become afraid. And to think that you're going to lose. What you need to do is stop trusting in yourself and put your trust in the Lord like Amen. David did. David wasn't confident because of his own physical abilities. He was confident because he was trusting in the Lord and he knew that the Lord could do this. And what did he say? The battle is of the Lord. He said, it's the Lord's battle, didn't he? That's how I believe how he worded it. It's the Lord's battle. The same way of wording that would be the battle is of the Lord. It's the Lord's battle. One of the things also that it says here in verse number 30. It says this, the mighty men of Babylon have forborne to fight. They have remained in their holds. Their might have failed. It says this, they have, they have, or they, sorry, became as women. They tried to criticize me because I referred to Jimenez and, and Manly Perry and all these guys as a bunch of sissies and a bunch of women. Even Steven Anderson got on a post one time and he wrote on there like, did you hear the way he's like referring to the, the people as women, like he's like degrading women. He's like talking down about women because he's saying that they're like women. It'd be a horrible thing to be, you know, like one. No, for a man to be like a woman, according to the Bible, it's a horrible thing. Amen. For a man to act like a woman and not want to fight is a horrible thing. Right. You know what was going on with Jimenez? Do you know what was going on with Perry? Do you know what was going on with Romero? They were not mad enough to stand up and fight even when it came to friendly fire. Right. Even when it came to somebody who's on the side of good that was fighting on behalf of evil. Even when it came to someone that they loved or whatever, a neighbor. The best thing they could have done was not be afraid of Stephen Anderson, was not be afraid of Faith Forward Baptist Church, was to stand up and tell him and tell everyone, hey, what he's doing is wrong. Amen. It's evil. The way he treated these people is wrong. He's preaching heresy now. He, what he's preaching is different than what he preached before. Right. Instead of all these people just flip-flopping immediately. They all say the same thing. They all literally preach identical messages. Yeah. They have the same interpretation of all the same verses. You know, every time they preach on it. Then Stephen Anderson changes. Stephen Anderson flip-flops. And literally, two days after the event that with me took place, two days after that, he preaches a sermon that contradicts what he preached for 10 years. Think about that for a minute. Let that set in for a second into your brain. If you don't realize what happened and you think that, oh, he's just confused. Oh, he just loved me for 10 years. You're a moron. Right. You, are, you are willingly blind. You're a moron. And what it comes down to is uh, Roger Menez is a woman. Right. Yeah. Manly Perry is as far from being manly as can, as can possibly be. He is a woman. You have forborne to fight. You're a lady. You're a sissy. You're a little girl. You're afraid of fighting. Oh, yeah, it's okay with LGBTQ time. I'll call them faggots. I'll preach against these sodomites. I'll preach against these queers. I'll preach against adultery. I'll preach against all these other heretic false religions. But when somebody that's on the side of good, when somebody, when it comes to friendly fire, what happens? They become afraid. They become scared, don't they? You know what they were? They were afraid. They became as women. Hey. Don't give me this crap all day, all day. Roger Jimenez is afraid to stand up and preach what he believes about the Trinity. You're afraid! Right. You're a woman! You're a sissy! You're a little girl! Right. You are afraid to stand up and preach that I believe three persons, one person. He's afraid. He won't even say it anymore. Yeah, right. Why wouldn't you say it, Roger Jimenez? Because you're scared. Because right. you're a woman. Because you're afraid. You're afraid. You're afraid. There's no other. Why wouldn't you? Right. Give me another answer. 
He brings up the Trinity constantly. He wants to preach about it all the time. What his sermon that he preached in response to all this, his core response was, this is what I believe, this is what I've always believed, three person, one person. He hasn't taught that one time since. He's talked about the Trinity scores and scores and scores and scores of times. He hasn't taught that one time, one time since then. He stood up on a dry erase marker, with a, on a dry erase board with a dry erase marker, not being sloppy, not being, hey, this is a well-thought-out sermon as a response to a critical issue, and he taught, Jesus is Jehovah, right? We all agree Jesus is Jehovah, right? Okay, well, you know what that means? That means that Jesus equals the Father. Stand up and say it again if you're not a woman. Right. right. Stand up, and I want you to write it on a dry erase board, Jesus equals Jehovah. You know why that's a ridiculous thought to everyone in here? Because you know without a shadow of a doubt that he won't do it. Right. Because he's afraid. Right. Because he's scared. Man. Because he's a woman, that's why. That's what it is. Right. They were born to fight. Right. Yeah. They, they, they're scared. You know what he did? He went into his hold. Mm -hmm. He went and he hid. He went and he was afraid. And yeah, he'll fight. He'll fight, you know, evil. He's engaged in the battle of evil. Evil. But when push comes to shove and somebody on his side, they start friendly firing, he doesn't even turn back. He doesn't even try to defend the truth. He doesn't even... Now, I don't agree exactly with Roger Jimenez's position. I think he's wrong to a degree. But he's a lot, lot closer if, you know, if he hasn't flip-flopped. His position is a lot, lot closer to my position than Stephen Anderson's new position. So he could at least be fighting for the truth a lot more than, than anybody else if he would have been willing to stand up. And when you expect certain people and you, you, you believe that they have a higher integrity and then they just fold like a stinking cheap suit. They just fold like a deck of cards. And just, you know what they became? A bunch of women. Right. Stephen Anderson sounds like a stinking liberal feminist. When he's like, oh, he's, make, he's uh, making fun of them. He's saying they're women. He hates women. He degrades women. <laughs> You sound like you took a stinking, you know, college history class or college feminist class or something. <laughs> college liberal arts. That's the same kind of crap. He's defaming women by saying the men are acting like the women. You're an idiot. It just shows how stinking desperate and ridiculous these people are. Right. That's where they go. Once you read your stinking Bible every once in a while, you moron. They have forborn to fight. Roger Menez has become like a woman. Jeremiah 51, what is it, 30? Jeremiah 51, 30, Roger Jimenez. You become a woman. Amen. And he, he tries to respond with my video with Stephen Anderson. I'm not ashamed of that video, even a tiny bit. I have no problem talking about that. There's nothing that occurred there that's, that, that I'm ashamed of at all. Not even, not even a little bit. I stood there and had a conversation with Stephen Anderson, who was my pastor and was my boss. And here's the thing. If anyone in here thinks that I responded in the wrong way, your heart's not right with God. Yeah, right. That what I did was how you should respond, and that's the Christian thing to do. Amen. If here's the they want to you know they, they want to talk about all of these other commandments that the Bible teaches when it's easy for them to keep. All the commandments about, you know, easier commandments, not committing adultery and things like that. You know the hardest commandments in the Bible are all the, always the commandments we have to be humble. Mm -hmm. Really, that, that, like I talked about just a couple of weeks ago, turning the other cheek. How hard is it when someone hits you to not slug them back? It'd be very hard, wouldn't it? Right. You know why? Because you, you have to use humility. That's why. The Bible commands you. To be obedient unto your masters, even unto the froward. Right. Or Stephen Anderson, either one. Right? <laughs> the Bible commands that. Yeah, and, if, yeah. and if I wouldn't have been obedient unto him, I wouldn't have treated him like my master or treated him in that way, I would have been disobedient to God. Right. So when someone actually does what the Bible tells them, they mock and make fun of that, that shows you where their heart is. Right. I'm not afraid of that. Right. I'm not, that doesn't bother me even slightly. Let them keep making themselves look like a bunch of fools that don't know the Bible when I'm actually they're posting videos to mock me and make fun of me while I'm being obedient to God. Right. Don't, don't, you know, this may be a little bit fleshly, but don't, you know, get it twisted. That's, I'm going to use the language that I was going to use instead of being informal. 
you know, being more formal. I'm, you know, physically, Stephen Anderson is, is the least person that I would ever be afraid of. He's, I, I, I have no problem saying this, you know, whether someone thinks this is flesh, fleshly or not. That's not the point of it. He's, he's the most uncoordinated person that I've ever seen in my entire life. He's super unathletic. He's not a strong person, but he tries to, because he's a prideful man, he tries to put himself forth in every area of life as being, like, the greatest at everything. Correct. He is the, the, guy, the kid at school that couldn't play sports and his life depended on it. He's super uncoordinated. If you don't believe me, throw a football to him and ask him to throw it back. <laughs> I'm serious. Toss a football to him and ask him to throw it back to you. Tell him to, dri hey, dribble this basketball for me, buddy. Or just throw it back to me. Steven Anderson is a nerd. Just the, he's, he's a dorky guy. You know what? There's nothing wrong with being a nerd. But there is something wrong with a person that's nerdy, that's lying and trying to make themselves look like something else that they're not. Right. You know what he's doing is he's compelling people that maybe were nerdy or nerd, were, were you know, kind of dorky in school to try to want to fit that image, even as a Christian. It doesn't matter. That, that's ridiculous. You know, yeah, you know, you know, being strong and things like that are important. But you don't need to try to post videos of you, you know, looking like you're strong. My, my daughter's stronger than Barack Obama, Steve. <laughs> you know, that doesn't make you a tough guy. You know, Steven Anderson is, is, is not a physical specimen. He's a nerd that any person that plays sports up till seventh grade can handle with their left hand and their right arm tied behind their back. That's, that's just, that's ridiculous. You know what you had was, you had... Two men of God standing there, and you had one man of God whose heart wasn't right coming to the next, and he was, you know, accusing me of things that were not true, berating me and treating me in a way in which he shouldn't have been treating me, and you had me, you, what, what I was doing was exercising Christian principles. That's the truth, my friend. Yeah. That's what happened. I was, I was acting in a way in which I should have acted to my number one boss, who the Bible refers to as a master. Even when Sarah sent forth Hagar and, and abused her and treated her in a horrible way, God said, go back and be obedient unto her. You know that? Go back and be obedient unto her. The New Testament, of course, tells you to be obedient unto your bosses. Not only that, you're supposed to honor your pastor. They're like trying to criticize me for not, you know, standing up and like punching him in the mouth. <laughs> it's like, what in the world? How ridiculous can you possibly be? You know? That's ridiculous. That's the way that you should react to your pastor Amen. or your boss. He could, even if he would have laid hands on me, it wouldn't have hurt. But even if he would have laid hands on me, I wouldn't have fought back with him. That's the honest to God's truth. Now, if you lay hands on me now, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but here's the thing. That's, you know, that's the I highly respected that man. Right. And I was acting in a way in which, because my heart was right. And I was acting in the way in which, which was according, according to the Bible. And these people try to compare what I was doing while being obedient unto my master, being obedient to my pastor. They try to compare and mock that. And try to compare when I'm accusing them, or try as a response to me accusing them as being women. Of themselves being the pastors of their own churches who won't even stand up and preach what they really believe in their heart. Think about that. They won't even stand up with a major fight like this going on. Roger Jimenez, because his position is different than Stephen Anderson's, you know what? He doesn't want to preach it. You know what he's done? He's foreborn to fight. Yeah. These mighty men have done a lot of great things. They foreborn to fight. Why? A little bit of friendly fire came. Yeah. They're like, I don't want anything to do with this. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get into this battle. Right. This isn't something I want to fight in. Yeah. You know, that's, you know, stand up for the truth, my friend. Amen. Your allegiance should be to the truth, not some man. Amen. That's and that's right. what, that, you know, that's what the, the, the it's so sad, sad about that is they've, they've become as women. They have become, you see, when you really see a mighty man that you look up to, 
can come as a woman. I mean, let's, you know, when it comes to, you know, physical abilities or something like that, right? Like fighting in a physical fight. The worst thing that a man can do is be like a woman. Yeah. It's like the worst thing. That's what the Bible's saying. Women in situations of panic, like when somebody, we thought when our, our thing came off the door the other night, everybody knows about that, the little alarm came off the door the other night. The first thing my wife just, <sighs> somebody just opened the front door. <laughs> you know? She's just like totally freaked out. And I don't, I, this is just how women react. I'm not saying anything bad about it. This is how women are. If I went into the other room like a madman and checking things out, and I come back into the other room, and she's laying in bed still. I don't want her to get out of bed. That's not what I'm saying. My point is, she's being a woman. You know where Manly Perry and Roger Jimenez are? <laughs> They're laying in bed still. They let Stephen Anderson go check the door. That's what's going on. That wasn't prepared, I thought that was now. That's good. Yeah. That's where they're at. They want Steven Anderson to protect them. Right. They're afraid. They're afraid of the guy at the door, and they're afraid of Steven Anderson. Yeah, yeah, they are. That's, that is, that's, let me say this. If I don't care whether he is your leader or not. If I ever send out, I know Brother Elliot, Brother Rick, maybe still contemplating being pastors. If I ever send one of those guys out, I love them, and I'll always love them. If they start preaching heresy, I'll call them out. Amen. Amen. From the pulpit, if I had to. You know what? And I don't care. This is the point, though. That's not even my main point. I don't care if I'm their leader, if I'm the person that sent them out. Once they're a pastor, they're a pastor. That's right. If I start preaching heresy, you drop my name if it needs to be dropped. Amen. Amen. Don't be scared. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Amen. You know... Here's the thing, you, you would, you'd be like a woman. There's a battle there. It doesn't matter whether, yeah, you, I'm fighting over here, I'm going to ignore this. No, this needs to be handled too. This person needs to be handled too. You know what you need to do? You need to rebuke them. You need to call them out. You say, hey, this person is preaching heresy. I love this person. You know, Yeah, he might have sent me out. He did this, he did that. But what he's done is wrong. What he's done is wicked. What he is preaching and teaching is heresy. And this needs to be said so that I can warn people and so that maybe he'll get his heart right with God. Amen. You know what? If you're afraid, you're like a woman. Amen. You're like a woman. That's what you would be like. Yeah, you might want to keep battling with evil. But you're still afraid of this fight over here. There's still a fight going on over here that you're scared of. You're acting like a woman right here. You're afraid. You know, that's never happening here. Amen. I am going to do everything that I can do so when I die, Valiant Baptist Church is still Valiant Baptist Church. We're still fighting. We're still engaging in battles. We're still warring. Let's end on this note. Go to 2 Samuel chapter number 23. 2 Samuel chapter number 23. We're just going to read this and end. 2 Samuel chapter number 23. Second Samuel chapter number 23. Second <clears throat> Samuel chapter number 23. And then also the verse that we read earlier, the second, uh, second Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Paul says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. What's he talking about? The end of his life. He's talking about finishing the fight. Dying for value of Baptist Church. Look at 2 Samuel 23, verse 9 and 10. This is actually talking about the valiant men, the mighty men of David. It says this in verse 9. One of the men, it says this, And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Aoi, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were there, gathered together to battle. And the men of Israel were gone away. It says this, He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary. But watch this. And his hand played unto the sword. And the Lord wrought. Notice who's fighting. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to spoil. So many things you can learn from this verse. You know who's really doing the fighting? Same person that was really fighting when David came. The Lord. The battle is of the Lord. It's the Lord's battle. Right? But notice, 
He fought a good fight, didn't he? He said he finished his course, like Paul said. It said that he, that he slew the Philistines. He fought with the Philistines here. It says until his hand was weary. There's a time in your life when physically you're going to become weary. When you're old. There's times in your life, even when you're young, you can become weary. There's times in your life when you can become spiritually weary. You can become emotionally weary. You can become weak is what weary means, right? Where you can maybe want to give up. You can become discouraged, maybe from friendly fire, from battling with other people, right? You know what you need to do? You need to be on the side, make sure you're on the side of truth. And that comes along with cleaving your hand under the sword, the word of God. Amen. You need to clean. You know what you need to do? You need to grip that sword a little bit tighter. That's what you need to do when you become weary. Because that's what's going to get you out of it. That's what you need in spiritual battles. You need that sword. Everything in Ephesians 6 points back to that word of God. Everything. Everything ultimately relies on the word of God. You know what you, you, know what you need to do when you become weary? Don't give up. Don't become discouraged and try to get on the sidelines. Don't try to quit. You need to cleave your hand to the sword. Fight a good fight. Finish your course. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for 